let's talk about you. Let's talk about your memories of 9-11. What was going on that day? What were you doing? No, I was actually heading to the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is down in lower Manhattan, not far from the World Trade Center that morning. And um, I, I was on the FDR Drive, which is the East River uh, Drive. So it's on the eastern side of Manhattan. I was not too far from the Brooklyn Bridge, which is just maybe, I mean, as the crow flies, maybe a half mile from ground zero, when my phone rang. And my boss was telling me that a plane hit the Trade Center. So like most folks, I thought some Cessna or some you know little propeller plane smashed into the Trade Center. Pilot probably had a heart attack or something. and um, But I couldn't see it because the skyscrapers, but you know, even though those were very tall buildings, they were skyscrapers between me and them. So I had driven over there, pulled up to the scene. I remember finding a space to park in Manhattan was never very easy. But for some reason that day, I pulled right into a spot just on the other side of Seven World Trade Center. And I remember looking forward, you know, I had to lean forward in the car to see the damage, kind of like when you pull up too close to a traffic light. And you can't, so I'm leaning forward and I see, you know, the, the, the damage in the side of the building. And I still never realized, you know, at that point that it was a commercial airliner. I said, like, wow, that's a lot of damage. But, you know, my brain didn't process that it was a, you know, a, a giant plane, that, you know, a jet plane that carried passengers across the country. Welcome to Game of Crimes. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. This is going to be the second episode of the year 2023 in the year of our Lord, P.S.U. Domine, Dane, Requiem. And Murph, this is going to be episode 80, Ochento. I know. It's, it's exciting stuff. And, and to all our regular listeners, thank you for letting us have a little break in December. Uh, I needed the break from Morgan because you know why. And and uh, I think he, he says he might need the break from me. But hey, we're back now. Uh, last week's interview is phenomenal. The number of downloads, yep. the interest in John Mattingly's story. I am. I sent Morgan a, a text message this morning. I couldn't believe the numbers coming in. So welcome back. Welcome back, people, and welcome to you. And hey, look, obviously, that's Murph. I'm Morgan. Um, hey, we want to thank you back. Before we get started, though, just a couple quick things of housekeeping. Head on over to Apple and Spotify. Hit those five stars. It really helps us out. We really appreciate it. Also, head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. And if you noticed from last week's episode, episode 79, Sergeant John Mattingly and the Brianna Taylor Raid, we've got his books up there, 12 Seconds in the Dark. So go make sure you check out his book. We've got some other people coming up, too, that have books. We just immerse uh, working. I got a note from a guy. Um, we've, we're working with somebody across the pond, as they say. So mm -hmm. that is coming up, too. Uh, also, uh, head on over and find us on that thing they call social media, at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes uh, yeah, blah, I can't even talk. I don't have enough coffee. <laughs> At Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. And uh, it's my turn. I'm going to say, Morgan, where do you got to be? Where you got to be? Where you got to be? Murph, I'm going to tell you, uh, you probably can get. Hey, Morgan, where do you got to be? Uh, well, I, I got to be at, I got to actually get in a haircut next week. That's where I have to be. <laughs> I've had enough of this. I tried this. Hey, but where you have to be right now is patreon.com slash game of crimes. Folks, we have got a ton of good stuff on there. Uh, this new year is going to find us doing maybe some different things, but we've got fun. We've, we're closing out on the final three episodes of the real DEA Narcos on the real DEA Narcos Cali edition. So those mm -hmm. of you who were listening, it was the gift, the best. It's the gift that keeps on giving the December 25th episode that dropped <laughs> episode 12. If you folks have heard it, you know, Chris nearly had to take one for the team. So mm. if you want to know, uh, you got to go over to patreon.com slash gamer crimes, where we do all sorts of things from nine one one. What's your emergency to you can't make this shit up to Murph and I do. We got Q and a coming up. So we have to set that up. We're already getting questions in for one of our favorite things. So make sure, you know, share one, tell one, go over to patreon.com slash game of crimes. Hey, but uh, Murph, uh, you know, before we get started and I've got a surprise for you. Uh -oh. uh, but first, this is a show about crime, right? We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, but... We never take ourselves serious. We talk about serious topics, but we're going to have some fun. Well, and so I'm going to I'm going to mix it up on you. We're going to try a couple different things. We've actually had... It's not that people don't like what we were doing, but we had a couple ideas. And I said, okay, 
got an idea for you, because normally this is the part where I say, guess what time it is, Murph? And you say it's time mm-hmm. for, we say, small town police blotter. Well, we've had a couple of requests. Fred Nicolosi uh, was one of them. We had some other folks on the Facebook group. If you go over to uh, Facebook.com, just look for Game of Crimes fans, hosted by Sandy Salvato, our favorite mafia queen. Answer a couple questions, get in there. Well, this came from them, Murph. And they said, hey, look, maybe like uh, instead of, you know, we do case of the month on Mm -hmm. uh patreon but maybe we can do a smaller version called case of the week so i actually have a story here for you that might have been a candidate for you can't make this shit up but hey we're gonna do just a quick case of the week right and we're gonna talk about this right real quick just so y'all know i don't i have no idea what's getting ready to happen well Murph was about to say i have no clue and that would have been redundant so uh, (laughs) (laughs) hey but steve we we a lot of people have talked about cyberbullying right and the things you have to do right so as a parent you know if your child's been the victim of cyberbullying you report it right i mean you get to a point where you have to report it because people do some awful things don't they yep so kendra gail lacare from michigan um was the mother of a daughter who was being abused online, being cyberbullied. It got so bad, they had to call in the FBI to help them with it because they are up in uh, the Michigan area. But they said, okay. hey, look, we need some help you know, with this. So when the, when the daughter was being uh, you know, bullied, she turned to her mother. She mm-hmm. reported the bullying to authorities. She even went so far as to cooperate with the mother of her daughter's boyfriend at the time to help find the cyberbully who sent the girl up to a dozen messages a day. Now, initially, school authorities could not help. Local law enforcement did not have the resources. So what did they do? The Isabella County prosecutor said uh, when it came to our office, it was strange and unbelievable. He said that there is a continuous campaign of abuse. We are talking about several hundred text messages. There are more than 1,000 pages of text in the file. The messages were mostly disturbing, humiliating, and mean text messages. So they got the FBI involved. Mm -hmm. You know what the FBI found, Steve? (laughs) What? The cyber bully Uh was her own mother. What? (laughs) There, that's the reaction I was looking for. Um, the, uh, However, after computer experts from the FBI identified that the messages came from Lakari's phone, she broke down under investigation and confessed to the bullying spree against her daughter. The school superintendent <sighs> said the 42-year-old Lakari was a basketball coach at her daughter's school at the time of her actions. Uh, now, using a computer to commit a crime is a felony. But, man, it's worse than that. This is a mother. And now, look, they say 60% of all adolescents have experienced some form of cyberbullying over social media. So this mm-hmm. teenage girl is suffering it from, guess what, her own mother. Her mother was using a VPN, which is called a virtual private network, to disguise where she was coming in from. She was using juvenile mm-hmm. slang to do it. Um, but eventually, the detectives were able to connect the messages to uh, Lakari. Unbelievable. What, what was the reason other than jealousy? It doesn't say here. It just says um, at the time, it is unclear if there's enough evidence to transfer the case to trial and the hearing on the issue is postponed to January 12th. This just recently came out, but um, it does not say in there uh, why her mother was trolling her. Unfreaking believable. I wonder if there's, I wonder if it's a single mom household and, you know, can she go live with her dad? Because, you know, that girl, Well, she doesn't want anything to do with her mom now. Yeah, she said the, the victim went so far as to cooperate with the mother of her daughter's boyfriend. So, I mean, it, I don't see anything about the father in here, but again, you know, we're just doing just a quick case of the week, but I thought the twist on this, right, we're going to try to do something that has a twist on it. How many people would expect the suspect, the person committing this crime to be the mother? Oh, none. <laughs> I'm, I have to say I was shocked. That might have been evident in my response. <laughs> you huh? would what? say what? So, hey, what? that's kind of like our quick, uh, you know, case of the week. I mean, little twist there. I'll try and find some things in the future. Hey, but just give us some feedback. Hey, if you like what you heard, let us know. Uh, if you still like, we had some people that said, hey, they didn't like small town police blotter at first, but then it grew on them. And like it grew on me. You know what I mean? I, I kind of like this thing. So, hey, but we're. I'll tell you what, man. We, we Connie and I just heard one on television the other day. It's a Florida story. Of course, it's going to be Florida. I will get it and send it to you. <laughs> we'll use it on one. It's just, it's like you say, you can't make this shit it's up. It's a Florida story. Well, speaking of uh, stories, we've got a great story for you this time because on Game of Crimes, we have featured several just badass people from all sorts of law enforcement 
uh, mm -hmm. federal, state, local, across the pond, you know, foreign. But ATF uh, has got some obviously exciting stories. And we touched on this in a couple of our other interviews with ATF people about Fast and Furious. And Murph, you were able to reach out and get the guy who basically broke this open, testified before Congress, and paid a price for it, Pete Forselli. Yeah. Pete was, uh, you know, you, our listeners, you've heard us say before, and this isn't a uh, bad cop issue, but nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. Well, we've had a lot of folks from ATF on here, and it seems like we're always picking on them because on the agency, not the the individual agents, because apparently their headquarters is Treats not standing behind like their shit. people. You're not kidding. It's it's amazing. And, and some of these folks we know personally. Uh, we've gotten to know them through the podcast, but some of them we knew before the podcast. And so if you if you remember the case, Fast and Furious, not the TV show, but the, the ATK, ATF case in which they were authorizing agents to allow automatic or weapons to go across the U.S. border into Mexico with the intent of tracing those weapons back to the leaders of the cartels. Well, and Steve, that makes That's as much sense as you guys getting a ton of cocaine in and allowing a ton of cocaine to walk to see where it ends up being distributed to. Exactly. There's just some things you don't do. I mean, and this is how serious it was with DEA. If we wanted as small an amount as, as an ounce of cocaine, even smaller than that, our rule was never let the dope walk. If you wanted to do that to further an investigation, it had to be an extremely high-profile case, and you had to go up to the D Department of Justice, the Attorney General, to get authorization to do it. So you don't do certain things. You know, you you are authorized by law to violate certain laws in furtherance of your investigation, but that's not one of them. No, that's not. And the other thing too is one of these weapons was used in the murder of uh, Border Patrol agent Border Patrol. Brian Terry. And this this I Steve, I was at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial during co Police Week when they were reading out the memorial for Brian Terry. And guess who was there? Eric Holder. And you know what a bunch of the ATF and Border Patrol people did? They stood up and they turned their backs on him. No kidding. Yep. I was I was I was uh, I was doing a lot of fundraising for them at the time. I was in the the VIP section and I watched. Wow. I mean it was uh, I wish I I didn't take pictures because you just don't you just don't do that glad handing kind of stuff during that time. But yeah, they were there and they turned around, they turned their back on him, and it was a, it was an emotional point. And but you know, Pete's got more than that too. He he's got one of the most emotional stories though too about nine eleven because he was there. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a great story. Look, we're we we do not want to tell you any more about it because you got to right. you got to just get ready to hear the story. So Murph, let me ask you. Are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all? The original, revised, refreshed, updated, and <laughs> loaded Game of Crimes for 2023. You know it, brother. So all our listeners, get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. Listen to the story of a man who has the stones to stand up and do the right thing. Pete Friselli. Yeah, yeah, we are uh, just getting started here. I'm just making sure I knew how to pronounce Pete's name, so I won't tell you <laughs> what I say said. What you just did, <laughs> but it's Forcelli. So, uh, hey, look, man. First of all, this is going to be. We are doing. We took December off, and so we're recording a lot of episodes in December, which will come out in January. So, first of all, let's welcome to the podcast the man, the myth, the legend, originally from New York, as you may detect by his accent, and now my neighbor over here in Northern Virginia, Pete Forcelli. Welcome, buddy. Yeah, it's good to be here. <laughs> good Glad to, be to have here. you on the show, Pete. Uh, thanks. So, uh, tell us about that accent. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm a Bronx kid. You know, I, I lived in the Bronx in Yonkers for 40 of my years on this planet. Uh, spent a very brief time in New Jersey. Uh, got taxed to death there and then decided to promote out of the New York area. And, uh, you know, and fled to Phoenix where my accent disappeared a little bit. But it's funny because, uh, you know, when I first got there, my agents, they used to joke around and say that they felt like uh, extras in uh, an episode of The Sopranos every time I had a group meeting or something. <laughs> I was thinking the same <laughs> thing. And let me tell you what, your accent didn't go anywhere, Pete. You still got it, brother. <laughs> you still got it, man. Well, let's, speaking of that, like the, the Sopranos, Cosa Nostra, thing of ours, let's talk about this thing of ours, thing of ours. How did you get started in this thing of ours we call law enforcement? Because you started uh, New York City Housing Authority, right? 
Yeah, back when there were three different departments. There was a housing, transit, and the NYPD. I was a housing cop. And it was like like most folks, man. I, you know, growing up, I loved cop shows. I thought, you know, policing was going to be real exciting. And then, you know, then you get on the job and you realize- What was your favorite cop show growing up? Well, there was many. Starsky and Hutch. Um, you know, I mean, the rookies. Uh, geez, well, I know Beretta uh, wasn't a cop. He was a PI, but I like Beretta, Magnum PI. I mean, all of those shows were just, you know, that's the stuff I was raised on, you know? And notice Murph, he didn't say Miami Vice. See? He just didn't get uh, to it. Yeah. <laughs> you were interrupting him. He was continuing. No, but I'll tell you, there was a period when I was a rather new cop where some of our guys thought it was cool to wear the T-shirt with the suit jacket on. They, they, they yeah. tried to go for that. Look, it didn't go well in the Bronx, though. It just it didn't fit. <laughs> It was, it's kind of off. Hey, yeah, you you, you got to wear those baggy pants, man. That that's a South Florida thing. Yeah, you got to do that. Thing. <laughs> hey, well, let's do this real quick before we get into that. I want to bring up something because we are recording this on December eighth, uh, in the year of our Lord, twenty twenty two. P a s to domine, domine est requiem. And I sent Murph a note earlier and Zach a note earlier because it was found out and discovered this morning at the last minute that they had uh, traded Brittany Griner for Victor Boots. So I. You're shaking your head. That's kind of look. I want to kind of get a hot take on that real quick before we get into the story because this is fresh stuff. As even though this is going to come out in January, as we're talking about it, this just occurred a couple of you know a few hours ago, uh, and I was sitting here on my desk when I saw this thing scrolling. I sent a note to Murph and Zach right away. It's kind of like, what the hell? So, wh what's your thoughts about that? Oh, well, it's infuriating. And look, I know Murph must have a, a you know a similar take on it, especially since it was a DEA case. I mean, they did a, such a great job on that. But here's here's a guy whose nickname was the Merchant of Death, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, an enemy of the United States. And what do we trade him for? Uh, a woman who was very vocally, you know, not happy with the U.S. wouldn't stand for the anthem. And and you know, I, I get it. You know, um, we, we don't see Americans suffering abroad, but hey, we left the Marine behind. You know, I mean, I'm sure they could have worked out a better trade, a two for one or something, but it's infuriating how, you know, they'll bring, they, they'll let that guy go where again, he can go out there and wreak havoc uh, on innocent people and, and they, they trade him for someone who's not a patriotic American and, uh, and leave behind, like I said, someone who actually fought for our country. I mean, I have, I have such tremendous respect for our veterans and our armed forces. So to leave that man behind, I find absolutely like it, it's insulting as, as a proud American, frankly. You know, and, and nobody's even brought up the potential of retaliation here against all the people who put that piece of shit in jail to start with. You know, not just here in the United States, but around the world. Thailand, places like that, yeah. Morgan They're had listened to my ranting on text messages after that came out today. I just, uh, it, and Zach, you know what? I mean, you know, we texted, you texted him and he came back and he said, you know what? I'll still be having my hand over my heart tonight when they play the national anthem at his kids' basketball game. You know, that's, that's what, ah, shit, that's just, we ought to save that for another interview with Zach because I am. Well, we'll off. get into Zach, but I just wanted to quit. We don't want to dive into it. That's not going to be the topic of this because I don't want to take away, but I just wanted kind of your quick thoughts because um, we, we've already got some comments on our fan page, you know, in our group and stuff. And it's like, people are saying, hey, we don't want to leave an American behind, but we did. Uh, we left Americans behind in Afghanistan. We left Americans behind, uh, you name the place. Um, so it. This is going to be one of those things. It's going to be an interesting topic of discussion, especially when elections start coming around. Um, you know, because I'm like you. Here's a dude that was responsible for the deaths of six million people. His arms and ammunition and things he supplied resulted in the deaths of six million people. This dude should never see the light of day again. And does it suck that we have an American abroad who, by the way, did commit an offense. They say, well, I didn't mean to. Well, that's not a defense. I didn't mean to rob the bank, right? I didn't mean to have, yeah, I forgot I had 10 kilos in my trunk. I forgot to take it out. I didn't mean to do it. it you know, you go to another country, we have this discussion. It's your responsibility to obey their laws, yep. you know? So anyway, let's, uh, you, you know, you're taking a breath, Murphy. We're not going there. So we are, <laughs> let's just, a good boy. but the only reason I wanted to bring this up because it's hot on our minds, because this just happened literally hours ago. Like I said, they had the press announcement. Uh, the marshals started moving her last night. Uh, I mean, Victor Boot last night, actually. And they had some information on it, but the reporters could not talk about it. And they, they did the swap in um, uh, the UAE of all places. So we'll see what, we'll see why that we'll see later while they pick the UAE. Anyway, back to our regularly scheduled podcast. Let's get back to a thing of ours, Colson Oster. So how, how in the hell did you end up deciding that, Hey, I want to be a cop. 
Well, it's something I always wanted to do as a kid growing up, you know, and then finally um, I took the test to become an NY, uh, New York City cop when I was 16 and a half years old. You were allowed to take the test uh, at 16 and a half. So I, I took it at a high school in the Bronx, passed, um, you know, graduated high school. And, and you know, I, I kicked around the idea of joining the military, but because I knew I was going to get on with the NYPD, I didn't. And I, I literally hit the streets at age 20, which was probably too young, really, looking in hindsight. You, you not really fully matured at age 20. I'm sorry, when did you start, Murph? 19. I was 19 by (laughs) one month. (laughs) I turned 19 in October and started in November. I couldn't even buy a bullet. I couldn't buy a gun, (laughs) but I could carry one and shoot your ass. (laughs) Wow. Although, and I agree with you 100%. That was, I was extremely immature, but you do grow up rather quickly. Oh, yeah. Well, especially in New York. So, but um, did you have now, did you have family that had been on the job or uncles, father, cousins, anything like that? Nothing, nothing. My father, uh, my, well, my father and his father and, and his father were all in construction. Uh, they were all heavy equipment operators. And look, I saw that life and it wasn't appealing to me because my father was, he had a crane operator's license. And when he worked, he did well. But the construction industry back then, there was a lot of times where he was laid off. So, I mean, you know, he did well only to spend the money that he was able to save to get us through the rest of the year. And I didn't want that. And it was like I said, it to me, it's like, it just, there was this kind of like false sense that policing would be super exciting. And I'm not going to say I didn't love the profession, but what you see on TV and what you learn later on when you actually do the job, it's, it's vastly <laughs> different. It's like 90% boredom and 10% excitement and terror, you yeah. know? So, and 90% of that is fricking writing reports. Oh, oh yes. Geez. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why they had embellished narcos so much. Cause nobody wanted to see us sitting in the embassy, writing teletypes all day. Long. <laughs> <laughs> Cables and oh, here's what we got to do. So, but, yeah. um, why? So you took the test at 16 and a half. So when you got on, did you have your choice of going to NYPD transit or, uh, housing, or w- was that picked for you when you went to the Academy? Well, it, it's it's a funny story actually. Like the day I, 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 I got called one time to come down, and then they were like, "Oh, we, you know, they, they, they do the math. You think they would know this?" They're like, "Oh, you're too young." So I got I got called twice to go down to applicant investigations where they were, you know, they working on my background investigation where they sent me back home because I had to wait. So finally, when I was old enough to get in and I got called down, I showed up at the building. I forgot the what the address was, and everybody was going into this main auditorium and they stopped me. They go, Oh, you, you need to go up to the 13th floor. And I was like, Oh geez, like what happened? You know, I, I, I knew I didn't get in any trouble cause I had, you know, clean background. So when I get up to the 13th floor, there's a door that says New York city housing authority. And I, I, I walk in the, to that room and there's like 12 other people. And it's like, Oh, well, congratulations. Welcome to the New York city housing police. And at first I was like really disappointed because, you know, I didn't really know much about the housing police. I thought the job was going to suck, but I, you know, it was a policing job. I would have taken it. Initially, I thought I would do it and then move over to the NYPD, although Giuliani fixed that later. But I'll tell you what, being a housing cop in in the uh, in New York City was probably the best kept circuit in law enforcement. It was an amazing job. You know, I walked the beat in the projects a lot. You got to know people. You learn real quick that your best gift is your mouth and your ability to talk to people. And that a nightstick and a gun, you know, you need those things. But um, you, you really learn um, – you know, relating to folks. And I tell you, the housing police, in my opinion, were like the the forefathers when it came to community policing. And once you built trust, man, I had people, you know, that looked nothing like me who would tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, you know that guy that the NYPD is looking for for a murder? He's over there or he's in that apartment. So I was making arrests that were pretty significant, but they were based on the, the trust that you built with the folks that you work with. And, and I guess in some ways, that's why I have a lot of respect for the cops that work in small towns, because, you know, they, they have that ability to do that a lot better than big city cops, because you know, the folks that you're policing, you know, the community, you know, the store owners. So it was, but it the was other a- thing though, too, Pete, is you got to live there too. It's not like New York where you may go from the Queens, you know, from Queens to another area, you know, the or we, we actually had a buddy of mine on Tommy Joyce. I don't know if you knew Tommy Joyce or, you I know, know Tom. Tommy very well. He's a dear friend, and he's a legend from an NYPD. Yeah. Well, and we learned from him why they why that's the only place they call the Bronx. Everything else is Yonkers, Queens, but it's the Bronx. But, but the difference in New York is you could travel for an hour and be completely out of your own neighborhood and work in another area, and nobody knows you, and nobody knows where you live. And like you say, the difference in smaller towns is you're going to run into those people. You'll run into them at the grocery store. You run into them at baseball games. And so you're right. Policing in smaller towns is different because you got to live with uh, all of your actions that you take while you're on duty. 
Yeah. Yeah. And we look, we should conduct ourselves that way, regardless of what police agency you work for. You know, I mean, we take an oath and, and it's not to the police department. It's not to the governor. It's not to the you know, federally. It's not to the president or Congress. It's to the people. You know, I mean, we have a duty to do the right thing. And that's that's how I've always looked at it. And that's how I've always carried myself. It's you know, it's, it's about the folks that we serve, you know. Very well said. Very well said. Yeah. Well, you said I want to circle back for something to clarify something. You said that uh you you knew you were going on to NYPD, so you didn't join the military. Had you joined the military, what branch were you looking at? Well, I was looking at the army, and I had met with you know, I met with all the the branches. Um, my daughter later went into the army. Um, you know, right after the Pulse nightclub shooting happened, uh, that was a, a, an epiphany for her. And my son, right out of high school, joined the Coast Guard. Now, knowing what I know now, I probably would have joined the Coast Guard, because they have some really cool toys that they play with and they do some interesting stuff. But uh, the Army interested me. And I look, I love all the branches, but uh, it's just something about what, I, what I've seen firsthand with the Coast Guard and what they do and everything is just, it appeals to me now that I'm a little older and perhaps a little wiser. <laughs> well, I'm glad you said that because this weekend is the Army-Navy game. So I, I have just have to say this in retrospect, go Army, beat Navy. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see if my prediction comes true. We'll see if what happens. So, all right, back to our uh, next part of the podcast. So when you got on, um, tell us about going through the academy. Because, I mean, it's we've heard, you know, stories from some of the other guys, uh, you know, that like Dan Murphy. We talked to Tommy, Mike Prate. Uh, what was your experience like when you went through the academy? How long was it? You know, did you stay? You know, were you living in the area? Were you commuting every day? What was it like? Well, I lived up by Yonkers Raceway. So I drove down every day to the, to the academy. Wait I went a minute. Through- you drove? Yeah. I you drove. had a car? I had a car, believe it or not. It cost $5 a day to park it, which back then was a lot of money. Um, we carpooled, me and some other rookies. And uh, it was weird. The academy, NYPD Academy, as big as a department as it was, our academy classes averaged like 1,200 people per class. And you literally went like a day shift and a night shift. And they had two different shifts working. So, I mean, they'd graduate like 2,400 cadets or, or, or uh, you know, recruits a year. So, but, you know, you, it was one building. It was basically like a six-story building on 20th Street off 2nd Avenue. And our our PT was done in a basically like two basketball courts that were fused together, a big gym, and where we ran like 36 laps in one direction. And then they would turn you around and you would run 36 laps in the other direction so you wouldn't get shin splints in one leg. It was the weirdest thing. And then you had people doing push-ups and jumping jacks right on top of each other. Um, it was it was interesting. But yeah, I went through around the same time as Tommy Joyce. Um, you know, I, like I said, I know Tommy pretty well. When did Well, when did you meet Tommy? Tom and I really didn't interact much in the PD because Tom was a Brooklyn guy and he was transit originally and I was originally housing, but I was always a Bronx guy. Um, Really, Tom and I connected more after our careers in the NYPD because we have a lot of similar interests in speaking up for law enforcement and defending them when they do the right thing. And also, you know, being critical of them when they do the wrong thing. You know, I mean, look, nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. You know, well, well where said. have we heard that before? <laughs> you, you have go. just said the same thing Murph and I say all the time. Nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. Um, Absolutely. Uh, you know, and by the way, too, if you folks are wondering, just go back to episode uh, 68, uh, part one, 68, part two, Tales of the NYPD, part one. And then we did Dan Murphy, uh, episode 78. Um, where we, we got some, so we're going to have to get some stories out of you too. But uh, so, but during the Academy, what was your favorite part of it? You know, it's weird. I, um, I liked law and we had mostly it was like social science, police science and law. I thought I would like police science the most because I wanted to be a cop. And, uh, it was actually the one I liked the least of the three, uh, kind of because our lead instructor was a bit of a, kind of a goon, you know, he just had a, a kind of that bully cop attitude, which kind of turned me off. But uh, we had a, a law instructor who was a good guy. He actually left the NYPD as an inspector, a guy named Tom Pellegrino. And he really took the time to just teach us the law. And for some reason, I really sank my teeth into it and liked it. You know, never wanted to be a lawyer. But I'll tell you what, I'm glad I did because it's, you know, knowing the law and knowing how you can be creative with the law can make or break a cop or an investigator. So I, it, you know, but that's ironically is the thing I thought I would like the least was the program I liked the most. Yeah, you're right, you're right about knowing the law because that's your job is to enforce that law. If you don't understand it and know what the elements are and so forth, I mean, you can't do your job correctly. Now, did you give Inspector Pellegrino shit about, hey, can I get a can I get a Pellegrino from you, Pellegrino? 
No, no. It's, but it's funny. He was he was just a cop when he taught me. He he left the NYPD years later as an inspector. But I mean, he he had such an impact on me that I actually reached out to him on LinkedIn, believe it or not, about a year ago to thank him for for the impact that he had on me because it, it certainly helped me through my career. You know. Yeah. So, and how long was your academy at that time? Was it like six months or something? Yeah, six months. It wasn't a live-in academy. Like I said, we drove down to that stupid building on 20th Street, drove back uh, five days a week. But uh, yeah, six months, You know, eight, either eight to four or four to 12 alternating shifts. So when you went through the academy, how many people in your class are you aware of? How many had never gotten a driver's license until then? Oh, there were, there were a lot. That was the thing. If you lived in the city, I lived in Yonkers by that time. If you lived in New York City, it was almost... It would bank. It would bankrupt you to own a car, uh, because you most of the time you'd have to pay to park it, and the uh, the parking space in in New York City could cost as much as renting a house or an apartment in some cities across the United States. It's crazy, outrageous. How yeah. do people do it? That's a good question. I don't know. I I never had to do it, so I don't know how they fit that into their budget. But <laughs> but folks do it. Oh mm. my god. So um. So as you were getting towards the end of training, um, how did you guys, how did they go about ass assigning you where you were going to be eventually? You know, I, I don't know, but I know that at the end you would just find out what, where you were going, uh, which, you know, living in Yonkers, they could have sent me anywhere. They could have sent me to Brooklyn, Queens. Uh, I was fortunate that they kept me in the Bronx because Yonkers is the next town just north of the Bronx. Um, so, but yeah, you found out it kind of at the end of your, uh, you know, academy training where you would wind up going. So I wound up going to a, a facility that was called PSA 8, which stood for Police Service Area 8, which covered like the Southeast Bronx and the North Bronx. Um, you know, it was a good place to learn, work with some great guys, you know, a lot of old timers there. Uh, and it was funny because the first thing I, I had an old African-American field training officer. His name was Rudy Edwards, old school guy. And I was a skinny little kid at the time. And I think when I graduated the academy, I weighed about 140 pounds. Holy you know, cow. I, yeah, I was thin. And it, so he told me, he goes, you know, he goes, look at you. We go with that shiny new leather and you got, you know, the patches look brand new. He goes, I'm telling you something, young man. He goes, the first motherfucker that gets in your face, he goes, you better knock him on his ass. Because if you don't, everybody that sees you out there is going to test you. Um, and he was right. I mean, you know, it's, you don't want to be a goon. But at the same time, you need to show folks because the you know, people, you know, in those neighborhoods, they talk to each other. They get to know, you know, and you got to build respect. And, you know, unfortunately, part of respect is you got to let folks know you'll stand up for yourself. But, of course, the most important part of the respect is that you got to give it to get it. So, again, you know, it was those old school folks that really taught you how to deal with people in the community. And, you know, uh, unfortunately back then, you know, crack had just come out. Eddie Byrne had just been assassinated when he was guarding that witness up in, the, yep. uh, in Queens. We talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. That changed the NYPD. So that's, you know, that's really when I came out was around that period. Um, so, you know, policing, it's, it's unfortunate, but in some ways it was, you know, oftentimes a full contact sport. Uh, people fought you, you know, um, I and mean, when you treated them good, though, you treated them good. It was weird because, you know, you hear things today. And I don't know if you guys have heard this on your podcast before. There was this weird kind of respect between cops and really bad guys that existed back then where they fought you. And if you had to use force, they expected that. There was no, hey, I'm going to sue you. I'm calling a lawyer. There was no parents coming down looking to, you know, burn the precinct to the ground. Um, and there were times like the desk officer who was usually a lieutenant would ask, the, the person who was, you know, scuffed up, what happened to you, son? And invariably, I fell, sir. So there was this kind of mutual respect <laughs> between bad guys and cops that, you know, when force was used, then it was accepted as part of the game, for lack of a better term. That's a, So it's kind of weird how things have changed now where use of force is, you know, it, it, look, excessive force is never acceptable. And I'm, I, I've you know, never condone that. But it's weird how even, you know, cops are so afraid to, to use force these days and they're getting hurt as a result. You know, and we see it all the time. Well, they've lost the appreciation of what the force continuum was really about because it means if you come at me with a fist, I don't have to use my fist. I can use one level of force higher to stop that. And I think you're right. I think lawyers have gotten involved. Lawsuits have made people sensitive. Uh, and, you know, look, let's face it. I mean, it, depending on which area you're in, if you're a white cop, 
you've got to be very careful about what you do. And folks, before anybody goes off and say you're being racist, said, no, I'm not. It's the perception. It's not what really happened. It's the perception of what people think. And I know people, I know from talking to people, they've intentionally pulled back from doing stuff. Why? Because they were afraid of the perception that might get out if they shot, if they did something. Because the difference today between today and, and your time on the street, my time on the street and Merce on the street, nobody was nobody was equipped with the camera except the fucking news. And it was easy to tell when the news showed up. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves. One of my best friends is a, a CNN reporter. And I met him during the whole Fast and Furious mess. We became friends then. He he told the story accurately, more so than a lot of the other reporters. Because there was a lot. The, the, the reporters were more political than the politicians during that scandal, I can tell you. But um, he was with he was with the Journal back then. He's now with CNN. Um, but I, you know, here... Look, I took a beating for blowing the whistle on Fast and Furious where, you know, the people in Mexico are not white folks. You know, they're brown skinned people were getting hurt with stuff. Shouldn't have been smuggled down into, you know, into their country. Uh, I've gotten some innocent folks out of prison over the years. None of them were white folks. And in each of those cases, you know, when, you, when you're fighting with the district attorney's office that you work with for years, you're going to get called every kind of name in the book. You're going to be accused of being a liar, an asshole, all kinds of things. So, you know. Knowing this, I asked him one time, I said, do you think that if I was to ever get involved in a shooting of a person of color, would would CNN portray me as a racist? And his response to me was, absolutely. It, you know, that's just how it is. If it bleeds, it leads. So, um, you know, that, but that's the, that's the face that, you know, that's the things that law enforcement's faced with right now is, you know, we don't get a fair shake. So, yeah, uh, you know, I agree. The times have changed. And I don't think most cops um, are racist. Uh, and, but I'll tell you this, too, and this is going to really probably get some people really pissed off. I've worked with some African-American cops who were rougher on their own people than any white cop I ever worked with, too. And I, and I even ask him, hey, man, like, you know, dude, calm down. and be like, no, he, he's making us look bad, meaning, you know, people of from his race. So, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of different things that factor into you know, how cops conduct themselves that, you know, I, I, you can't get into other people's heads, but, you know, it just, it, it's never good to paint groups with broad brushes, you know, and that, that includes the police. And, yep. and you don't know this, Pete, but um, <clears throat> when your episode comes, when this episode comes out in January, I think you'll be following the, the uh, interview from last week, which was John Mattingly, which was the uh, Louisville, Kentucky police officer that was shot and wounded in the Breonna Taylor uh, death. You know, and, and what we learned talk to him, it just it's it's outrageous and I mean it's it's really sad that somebody had to die because there was no reason for that lady to die that day. But the really sad part is the way the media blows things out of proportion, and then there are certain agitators, uh, some specific attorneys who are known to come in and just really agitate a group to uh, <clears throat> get press, you know, and then the press comes in. And what we have all know, we all have learned and we already know that they certainly won't let the truth get in the way of telling a good story, will they? Well, let's, since this episode is coming out after John's, then we can talk about this. Here's something people don't know. They portrayed John is a white guy living in Louisville. Breonna Taylor was black. The boyfriend who fired the first shot was black. Um, the main target of the investigation was black. They tried to portray him as a racist until you start digging into it. And here's something a lot of people don't realize. His daughter married a black guy. He's got two biracial grandbabies. And they have been together for like 13 years since they were in like seventh or eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And his statement was, look, if I, if I was racist, I could have squelched that 13 years ago. Yeah. He said, but he takes care of my daughter. You know, he treats her right. So it, the thing is, is that it was like Murph, we've talked about with you. You know, somebody will call you a racist until they realize well, n even if they realize it, but then they don't realize is that you've got two adopted girls who were Colombian, you know, while you were, and we talk about this in episode one, if I go back to episode one yeah. and then shameless plug for Patreon, patreon.com slash game of crimes. We do 12 episodes with him and JP where we go deep on that. And we talk about adopting your girls. Yep. Yep. So I, so I always love it when somebody keeps me being a racist, especially the Hispanic people. Yeah. And well, hey, I'm married to a full blooded Puerto Rican for what it's worth. So oh, uh, you got your hands full. How do you know she's full blooded? <laughs> well, I know. I've met her parents. I knew where she, <laughs> I knew where she grew up. I've I've been to the island myself a few times. Yeah, no. Hundred percent. So do you have a Espanol? You know what? I, I used to understand a lot more when I worked in New York. Um 
you know, I, I was never very good at speaking it because I never felt confident in it. So I'd sit in the interview room and understand most of what was said. But yeah, I've 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 lost most of that ability. Well, you've got your wife to translate for you, so. Yeah, well, when she talks to her mother about me, they, you know, they prefer that I don't understand. <laughs> How long have you been married? Thirty years, almost. Ah, congratulations, yeah, brother! Yeah. Only, only marriage. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We, uh, I was twenty-seven um, when when we got together. So, uh, yeah, it's been um, it's been a long time. But uh, it, we, it, she was a, an EMT in New York, so it's kind of you know one of those pairings where she was in the civil service, I was in civil service, and we just met each other, and we've been together ever since. Did you meet each other on some shooting calls, or uh, you know? Uh- of, you know, crimes? No, actually, you know, in New York, there was this thing, if cops got in trouble or if someone got really sick or a kid was really sick, they'd have these fundraisers. They call 1013 parties where, you know, you'd go to a bar, you know, you'd pay, you know, don't, a, a ticket to get in and then you'd buy drink tickets and the bar would contribute a lot of the proceeds of the liquor to, you know, to the family. I, I was working the door at a 1013 party for a cop who got jammed up for, um, using force on a guy who happened to, well, it turned out later to be the Bronx borough president's nephew or something, completely justified use of force. He was exonerated after trial, but he, you know, he was getting some, um, you know, he had some legal debt and whatnot. So it was a fundraiser for her brother-in-law that I met her at. And then the rest was history. I was working the door when she came in. So, yeah. Did you sweep her off her feet or did she sweep you off your feet? Well, she swept me off my feet. Yeah. I was, <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. You probably said you probably had some cheesy line like I need to see your ID because there's nobody there's no way somebody that looks as good as you can be this old. So truthfully, I was probably too buzzed when I was working the door <laughs> to have any lines. Yeah, uh, it was a good a, night. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that before we start talking about uh, going into the work in the Fed. So let's book in this conversation first. How long were you on um, uh, New York, uh, the, the housing police? Before it became NYPD, well, I, I became a detect. Well, I was I was brought into the detective bureau in the Housing Authority Police Department in two thousand. I'm sorry, two thousand in uh, nineteen ninety four, and then in nineteen ninety five, Giuliani merged the departments together, and then I wound up going into the detective bureau in the Bronx, uh, originally the forty seventh precinct, which back in ninety five led the city in homicide. So it was you know it was a great place to learn how to work murder cases. Um, and then I bounced around. I wound up in the 45th precinct for a short time, which was, you know, initially I was pissed off because it was a quieter precinct and all the detectives were old guys for the most part. And you know, I was at the time, I was like 27 years old, you know, uh, and here the next youngest guy I worked with was 53. What a gift that turned out to be, man, to just learn from those old timers was absolutely amazing. So it's funny, you know, you never know what you're going to get till you get there. I was pissed off at first. I eat those words now. So then spent a couple of years. Um, hey, real quick question before you do that. Let me ask you real quick about the consolidation. What drove that consolidation? What 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 were the conditions going on that drove uh, combining transit and housing and NYPD together? Yeah, I don't know. Giuliani did it. Bratton was the police commissioner at the time. Uh, he was a great boss to work for. I, I certainly have a, a ton of respect for Bill Bratton. Um, but we, we hated it. Because, you know, look, I said, I didn't want to be a housing cop. Once I got the job, though, it was a, it was such a well-kept secret. We called it the hostile takeover. And we still do. I mean, if you ever looked at LinkedIn, <laughs> the housing guys, we still have some resentment for that. But um, so, yeah, I, so I don't know what, what led to it. I don't know in hindsight that it was good for the people that ride the subways or the people that live in public housing. But, um, yeah, but they did it and we you know, painfully went along. Did they maintain parity with your job? I mean, it's like it sounds like you were able to keep your uh, detective status. Did, did they? Did everybody kind of stay where they were at, or do they have to make some adjustments? Like, did some sergeants have to go back to being a patrol officer, or lieutenants become sergeants, or anything like that? Well, you know, they could have did that with the folks that were detectives, because technically a detective isn't a rank, it's a designation, but the sergeants and lieutenants, those are civil service ranks. So I think they probably were somewhat legally bound to honor those, um, you know, and, but I mean, and then above captain, like deputy inspector, inspector, those are all designations as well. So they probably could have shuffled some of those folks around. I don't think they did. Um, they, I mean, there could have been instances where that happened, but uh, for the most part, I think everybody was was treated as fairly as they could have been, frankly. Well, and so when I was saying let's book in this, how long were you on NYPD before you made your move? When did you start? When did you leave? 
NYPD, I started when the merge happened. I think it was around. Well, I mean, but let's. I mean, like, but New York City housing. Uh, you know, so when did you when did you start becoming a cop? Uh, when did you end up? When did you end being a cop in New York before you went to the feds? Uh, well, I started in January of 1987, and then I left. Um, May thirtieth of two thousand one for ATF. So, okay, so uh, you had about fourteen different- years. Yeah, fourteen and a half years, and I spent my last four in the Bronx Homicide Squad, where I was mostly working with ATF, um, doing this program called Operation Trigger Lock, where we took people that had felony convictions with guns and we took them and we charged them federally. And um, it, what we did is because they, they, they were looking at a ton of time, they all came in. They all wanted to sell you know, every piece of information that they knew to to minimize their sentence. And you want to talk about a treasure trove of intelligence. I mean, it was, it was what I was able to do as a homicide detective working with ATF sold me on why I needed to leave the NYPD and become an ATF agent. I was solving more murders that way than I was working murders the traditional way, because, you know, I mean, the U S attorney's office in Manhattan is really like they're hard chargers. So if you get arrested, um, they're going to charge you with everything they could find on you and then flip you and proffer you. And we were solving murders. We were building RICO cases. We were building Hobbs Act robbery cases, all based on information that came out of these um, felon in possession of firearms cases. It was it, it was those were 924 C's. Some of them were 924 C's if they used those guns in the furtherance of federal crimes of violence. Most of them were just straight up 922 G. Like I got arrested three years ago for a burglary and you I got, got a call for the felon gun. in possession, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that was, I mean, we, well, during that period, like the murders in the Bronx when I started in the homicide squad averaged around 600 a year. By the time we left, they were down to around 200 a year. And some folks actually say that it was what we were doing with those cases that that reduced the homicides because we were locking up some really bad guys who were, you know, they were responsible for themselves, like five or six murders. But then also word got around, hey, man, if I get caught with a gun in the Bronx, I'm going to do fed time. You know, people were leaving their guns home. So it, it, it really was pretty cool to be part of that. But it, it sold me on why I had to leave. The other thing is, you know, that that same year. Um, I had a case that happened when I was still a detective in the four seven, where a four year old kid got beat to death by his stepfather. The kid shit himself. The was, the stepfather changed him. The kid shit himself again. He had like something. You know, he, he was not. Um, he was developmentally disabled kid. So the, you know, the father was incensed that here he just changed the kid and he soiled himself again. So the, the stepfather beat him to death. And um, that case had gone to trial, and the guy gets sentenced to four years. And I was looking at what? all of these. Yeah, four years. Four years. Four it was years eight. for beating a child to death? A four-year-old child, yeah. And, but, but during that same time, I was getting these felons in possession of firearms sentenced to four years if they didn't cooperate. And I'm like, what am I doing here? Working. Mur-. I said, it just made perfect sense to leave and and you know pursue a federal career. And that's, that's exactly what I did. Well, before we get to that, let's rewind a little bit too, because I want to talk to you. Tommy and Mike had some great stories. Dan had some stories. We got to hear a couple of your stories before we move on. So you got to tell us about a couple funky things that you were involved in. Okay, funky things. Well, I mean, I, I saw some ba- like Happy Land Social Club fire responded to. I mean, you guys heard about that one. Some guy got rejected by the coat check girl at a place in the Bronx. I was working a midnight shift, so the guy went to a gas station, filled up a gallon of gas, and g- g- took a book of matches and lit the place on fire. And killed 87 people inside, most of them teenagers. So that's some crazy stuff that I had to respond to. But uh, I, I give you a funny story. When, um, when shortly after the merge of the housing and transit police, I was working. No, for- I got to correct you. Shortly after the hostile takeover. Yes, correct. <laughs> you are so correct. Uh, there, a, a cop, a cop got shot in the face in Co-op City. A cop named Angel Sostra got shot in the face. He just dropped off his wife and kids. They would come back from a movie. He went to park the car. He came b- back to the building. He got in the elevator, and as he's riding the elevator up, the door opens, and a guy tries to snatch his chain. And as he pulls his chain out, he sees a lot of those. A lot of cops carried like a little miniature badge, on. So he sees a badge and shoots the cop in the face. So. Um, at the time, I was working in a precinct, um, the 46th precinct, for a short time, and I get a phone call to, to, hey, get your vest, get your memo book, and get your ass over to the 4-5. You're going to be assigned to this task force. <laughs> so, And I wound up later working at the 4-5. That's where I was talking about with the old timers. But th- this was just like a, you know, a temporary assignment. 
So I, I walk in, it's about 8.30 in the morning, and it's like Barney Miller. It's like an old, old precinct. And when you walk into the detective squad, there's one of those like half walls, you know, with a swinging gate. So when I walk in and I, I, I could smell in the air, it smells like booze. And I'm like, wow, man, this is pretty cool. These guys must have hit it hard last night. You know, that's what I'm thinking. So I knock on the gate and I hear somebody in the, in the, the supervisor's office, which is tucked away on to my right, saying, yeah, yeah, come on in, come on in. So I walk in and there's a sergeant there who I later worked for, but I didn't know him at the time. His name was Bill Larkin, old school guy, old Irishman, cherry red face. He's sitting behind his desk and he's signing shit and he's got on his, on his desk a glass filled with scotch. It's eight. It's eight thirty in the morning, and this guy. And I'm not talking like a, a you know three fingers. I'm talking. He's got like a healthy serving, <laughs> bigger than what I would pour a glass of orange juice for myself in the morning of scotch. So he sees me, and I look at it, and he looks at me. He goes, "So who who the fuck are you?" And I go, "I'm Pete Fasel." He goes, "Oh, you're, you're you're the project kid." He goes, "Hey, if it makes you feel better about yourself, go piss on a radiator." So I was like, ah, you know, I took the joke, laughed a little bit. Um, so then he looks at me again. He goes, "So what do you drink, kid? The clear stuff or the brown stuff?" And at the time, I was, I mean, I like bourbon now, but at the time, I, when you're young, you mostly drink beer. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I didn't want to offend the guy. So I said, oh, I, I like the brown stuff. He turns around in his chair, and behind him, hanging up on a, on a coat rack, is a, like one of those old Murray the Cop jackets that the NYPD guys wore back in the day, because he was an older guy, with the brass buttons on both yep. sides, a yep. choker. Uh -huh. And he, this, the sleeve is tucked into the right front pocket of the jacket. So he pulls the sleeve out. And what's there but a bottle of Tullamore Dew. And he takes a glass out of his drawer and pours me a glass of scotch that's as deep as his glass of scotch, which I, in my entire lifetime, I don't think I ever drank that much scotch. And he puts it in front of me. And now it's like, hey, wait, I haven't even had like breakfast yet. I just got here. It's 830 in the morning. And this now this, this guy just laid the gauntlet down that I got to drink a glass of scotch with him. So we're sitting there. And there's a, this is a high profile shooting that just happened. Well, who walks in next? Charles Camadena, chief of Bronx detectives. And Charles Camadena was no joke. A former Marine, carried himself like a former Marine. But I don't know how Bill pulled this off. Looks up at him. And chief was a younger guy. Bill was an old guy. And I think the chief, you know, being a Marine, respected his elders, even though he was many you know, ranks below the chief. So chiefy, what do you drink? The clear stuff or the brown stuff? The chief just looked at his drink, looks at my scotch, shook his head, and walked out. And it was never spoken of again. It was never spoken of again. But that was the culture in, the, in some ways back then. You know, some of these older bosses, they 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 did what they did. Well, what well, happened to those two glasses? Yeah, that's what I was going to uh, ask. Let's just I, – look, I, I wanted to be respectful, so I took a couple of sips. But they, I couldn't. I would, probably would have wound up in a hospital if I drank scotch that early on an empty stomach. But I, I, part of me thought it was a test, you know, like, can I trust this kid? Is he going to, and you know, at that age, I mean, look, he was retirement eligible. He probably didn't give a shit. Um, but you know, it was, I kind of laughed it off, but yeah, no, I did not finish that glass of scotch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even the, even the small little town where I was a cop, there was a couple guys on the, on the night shift and you know, they, I had done a, a college internship with the city for five weeks in the summer. So I kind of knew these guys. But then when you got hired on with them, you know, that's, it's a test of your loyalty and trust. And so in the middle of the night, they, we went up to the FOP lodge and, and, uh, you know, ostensibly to use the restroom and, you know, and that kind of stuff. And the next thing you know, they're reaching up in the false panels, pulling out a half a gallon of something, probably Jack Daniels back then. And they pour a little drinks like, Hey, Hey kid, take a drink. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I, I look, I had, when I first showed up in Phoenix years later as a first line supervisor, and this story has never been told, although I'm writing a book on uh, Fast and Furious, and, and this is mentioned in there. I had a senior agent, a uh, guy named Slats, big guy, um, f d Detroit guy who's down in Phoenix now, phenomenal investigator. In fact, he was the case agent on that Black Biscuit case that Jay Dobbins did the uh, infiltrate yeah. the hell. Yeah, Joe was a great guy. So um, he here I'm a brand new supervisor, you know, and I had like six years with ATF, even though I had like 22 years of law enforcement experience. And Joe had 20 plus years with ATF, old school. Joe invites me out. That First day on the job for a beer. And you know, Murph, you drive into G Ride, you're not supposed to have a beer. But and I knew exactly what it was. It was a test from the senior agent in the group. Can we trust the new boss? So yeah, I I had my beer 
And then I, I drove to G Ride. Internal Affairs can't touch me anymore. Uh, didn't get drunk. So if any of these mothers are against drunk drivers, folks listening, I, I was responsible. But yeah, I mean, I get it. That's part of the culture sometimes is, hey, you know, they test you if they can trust you. I'm not saying it's always a good thing, but, you know, sometimes you got to use your judgment. Well, let me tell you this, Pete, man, because it, in 2000, I stopped drinking alcohol altogether. In December 2000, I was, started having these allergic reactions and different things. And and uh, so then I go to headquarters. I'm the only Southern boy in Special Operations Division in the uh, Caribbean, South American section. And everybody else is either from Boston or New York or L.A. And so the first time we go to the I mean, bar, like you know. Maltz, like Derek Maltz. Uh, he was our boss. He was our ASAC at the time. Good man. A legend. Oh yeah. So the fr- first night we go to the bar, you know, it's, it's, and it's just after work, everything's above board. And, and we had to drive our own personal cars back then anyway, you know, and everybody's bailing up to the bar and then come around to me, Murph, what you drinking? I said, Hey, give me ginger ale. And they're like, what the hell ginger ale? You want something in that? And I'm like some ice. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so then here you got this Irish cop that doesn't drink alcohol. And of course, everybody immediately thinks up oh, internal affairs. That must be OPR. He's a plant. And you know, you had to, even though I'd been a cop for all these years and, you know, and done the stuff in Miami and Columbia, um, you still had to earn their respect and trust, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Respect is everything. And, and look, reputation in law enforcement is everything, too. And you, you mentioned Derek. I mean, Derek, I, I still talk to folks that worked in New York when Derek was a boss up there. You you mentioned Derek's name. They light up. You know, you talk about a guy who was a leader that made an impact for all the right reasons. Derek Maltz is one of those guys. He's a very dear friend of mine. He's a neighbor. In fact, he's one of your neighbors. Last time I saw him was very close by, kind of in neutral territory in Sterling for a couple of frosty beverages. And I guarantee you, you heard him before you saw him. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. when he drives through Orlando, where I live now, I can hear him as he drives by. You know, he was, you know, hey, you know Murph, what? Murph, where are you at, Murph? Yeah, it's usually, hey, you effing hillbilly, what are you doing? You know what, though? For, for a guy that, that with his tenure – to still have the enthusiasm of a oh, rookie yeah. agent is really refreshing, though. You know. Well, oh, yeah. we've had him on too. We had Derek on too, and we talked about fentanyl and th- just this opioid crisis and the poisonings that are going on. And you're right, man. The dude is as passionate today as he was when he first started. But of course, when your dad is a DEA legend and he's got you out on an operation when you're 13 years old and you're on the radio as <laughs> two off. You know, 200 and a half or whatever their radio yeah. number was, he was calling in. <laughs> yeah, they're at this building right here. He's calling in as a whatever 15 or 16 year old kid on DEA radio saying, Yeah, this is 207 and a half. I'm over here. Yep, 201 and a half. And then, you know what? And that, I mean, that's what everybody used to say. You're, you're, we always referred to our wives as our half unit. So that's where that comes from. Yep. Got my one half with me. So, um, hey, well, let's, so, Let's kind of book in that too, because I want to talk about your glide path into the feds, because eventually we're going to get into talking about um, Fast and Furious. But Mm -hmm. you had 14 years in. I mean, another six, you could have had a pension. So why jump? You know, it was was a tough decision. And yeah, I mean, the the thing, it was like I had to weigh it. Like if I I did the full 20, I could have stayed. I probably would have gotten promoted to, you know, second grade. I was a third. NYPD is third grade, second grade, first grade detectives. First grade makes lieutenants pay. Second grade makes sergeants pay. That's, of course, before overtime. I was a third grader. um, So, you know, it's not a shitload of money. Um, But, you know, I I was like, well, if I wanted to go to ATF and I really liked what they were doing and I had that murder I spoke about, but, you know, just we, I felt like I was making more impact. But if I waited to do the full 20, I would have been too old to get hired by ATF. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't an easy decision, but I think it was the right decision. So I, I jumped ship and started as an agent in New York. And it was weird because my first case as an agent in New York was, uh, it started as a felon in possession case. It was a guy named Nice Bello, um, who was a prolific home invader. So I was working with the DEA Red Rum guys, um, who was, they specialized in home invasion cases. And, uh, so what, that was my last case as a, um, homicide detective and I actually took it with me to ATF. My lieutenant didn't give a crap. And um turned out like in the end, you know, through the proffering that we were talking about with the US Attorney's Office, wound up solving six murders and uh, over 145 home invasion robberies. Wow. Wound up like 23 defendant cases. So it was like the transition from detective to agent was was kind of in a way only like just a ch- I just carried a different badge in my pocket, but I was doing pretty much the same work. Um, but you know, six years there and then, you know, I was there for nine 11. I was there on that day. So let's, and- yeah, let's stop. But that, that's kind of what I was getting into, but I want to talk a little bit about that because that's, that's, I mean, you were in New York, you're a New Yorker. This is, uh, you know, a big impact before we talk about that. You said you worked a lot of homicides. How many homicide cases do you think you worked? 
personally, probably around 70, where I was like the, the main, the, the, like the lead investigator. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in, in having some role, I would say probably 600 or so where I was either helping knock on doors or being the one that had to go tell a family member that they was going to be making that notification. Or That or is the worst mm. part of the job, whether it's a trooper, detective, whatever else, knocking on that door and knowing you're about to give somebody the worst news they probably have ever had in their life. Yeah. No, it's, well, it's funny because, you know, I, I hate to say this because I didn't like doing it, but I had like colleagues who said, oh, you, you know, you're, you're good at that. Um, and I, I don't. You know, don't know that you're good or bad at it, but it's funny because I always wound up getting tapped to be the guy to do it after word spread. Oh, Pete, Pete's good at handling those, and I, I'd been to the door where you know sometimes people felt bad for me, and um, you know I'll, I'll handle this one, and then we would knock on the door, and they would literally like vapor lock because it was like they just did not want. So I I wind up having this. All right, I got it, and but um, yeah, I, I probably made two hundred notifications in, in my career on that, um, which is. Yeah, it, it takes a lot out of you, man, because, I mean, and look, you try to be as compassionate as you can, sit them down, you know, wait for someone else in the family to come there before you just get up and leave. Like, we never just left someone alone, like, all right, you know, have a nice day. It's like, hey, can we can we grab a neighbor for you? Or And, and there were times where somebody have a family member driving from, like, Albany or something, which is like a two-hour drive, and we're like, all right, we'll, we'll sit here and wait. And we would just try to be as respectful and kind as we could, you know? That's but yeah, that, that's a shitty do. job. Yeah, that's the yeah. humane thing to do. And that's, you know, a lot of people... Yeah, the sad thing is, and the media plays up the, you know, the the very, very, very small, minute, not even one percent of police officers that go bad, you know, that's what they play up in the media. When in reality, you got the vast, vast, vast majority, ninety nine percent plus of police officers who are just there to help people, you know. And you're going to take some time out of your schedule, and and with all the crime going on in New York City, you're just being a human being, man. And that's that's one of the most admirable things you can do. But it takes a toll on people. I, I know from um, talking to some of the military guys, I mean, they've got a complete process for doing that. But, you know, when somebody's knocking on your door at two o'clock in the morning and it's the police, it's usually never good news. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. All right. So let's talk about 9-11 before we get into that, because uh, when we're talking like we we let off talking about Victor Boot, well, the buddy of our Zach, Steve's buddy, um, we didn't realize until we started talking to him how, where he was at when 9-11 happened. He was at the DEA office. I mean, he's just like blocks away. So let's talk about you. Let's talk about your memories of 9-11. What was going on that day? What were you doing? No, I was actually heading to the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is down in lower Manhattan, not far from the World Trade Center that morning. And um, I, I was on the FDR Drive, which is the East River uh, Drive. So it's on the eastern side of Manhattan. I was not too far from the Brooklyn Bridge, which is just maybe – I mean, as the crow flies, maybe a half mile from ground zero, when well, my phone rang and my boss was telling me that a plane hit the Trade Center. So like most folks, I thought some Cessna or some you know little propeller plane smashed into the Trade Center. Pilot probably had a heart attack or something. And um, But I couldn't see it because the skyscrapers, but you know, even though those were very tall buildings, they were skyscrapers between me and them. So I had driven over there, pulled up to the scene. I remember finding a space to park in Manhattan was never very easy. But for some reason that day, I pulled right into a spot just on the other side of Seven World Trade Center. And I remember looking forward, you know, I had to lean forward in the car to see the damage, kind of like when you pull up too close to a traffic light. And you can't, so I'm leaning forward and I see, you know, the, the, the damage in the side of the building. And I still never realized, you know, at that point that it was a commercial airliner. I said, like, wow, that's a lot of damage. But, you know, my brain didn't process that it was a, you know, a, a giant plane, that, you know, a jet plane that carried passengers across the country. Um, it wasn't until I got out of my car and, and walked to the corner of Church and Vesey Streets where I saw basically on the lane on the ground was an engine from a plane. It was mostly intact, but it was banged up. But it was, and those things, they look big on a plane. They look way bigger when they're you know, standing there on the, on the street. And that's when I realized that it was a, you know, commercial airliner. So I, you did what cops do, you know, because there's no training for that. There's so much stuff going on. You just say, hey, folks, move along, move, you know, try to keep the pedestrians moving so that, uh, you know, emergency responders could get there. And then we, I went up to the plaza, which was above street level, but it was still like open air. Um, and we were keeping people moving out of there when the second plane hit. Um, and I was standing. Did you see the second plane come in? I heard it. it. I was on the other side. And um, what happened was right before the second plane hit, I was looking. It was a young female EMT, probably like 
20 years old or so, a Hispanic girl. She was tending to a guy that was injured by debris from the first crash. And I remember I was looking at her, and then I looked back up, and all I, I heard the, the, the sound, but I didn't see what, you know, where the plane was. And then the next thing I know, there's a fireball, which even though it was many, many stories above me, I could feel the heat a little bit, and the debris came down. It was loud. And then I turned and looked at the young girl who was tending to the um, – to the to the guy who was down and she was gone i mean she was you could tell the color had left her face she was killed instantly by something that hit her on, in the head um oh, God. yeah and then at, you know shortly after that then you start to see from the north tower which had been burning for a while people starting to jump which i could still hear the sound of how that sounded when they hit the ground which is horrifying but it's weird as a cop i got called a few times to jumpers and either they jumped and you had a crime scene or they were about to jump and you know they wanted to be talked off a lot of times as we know it was a cry for help and uh, but this is the first time i ever saw a human being actually jump um which really um still bothers me to this day and then you know so i at that point i was like look this is not safe to be here you know we went back down to street level and then one of my bosses from atf uh, grabbed me and said hey man you know like after a fire drill people are supposed to muster somewhere because you could do a head count well nobody showed up at the muster location i was a somewhat new agent and i didn't even know who all the people in the field division were but the boss asked me to go in you know you're trying to help i mean obviously you don't you know you want to be helpful when you can you know so i was tasked with finding our people and, and getting them to go to a muster location how now, long were you on atf when this happened three months oh wow yeah so well, i didn't even know place. everybody but, but the weird thing is like so i went down south into the um along church yeah church street and um while I'm down there, I ran into two ATF agents. It was like, hey, good. I found somebody at least. And I was watching some NYPD guys I work with, Vinnie Dans, John Coglin, and Walter Weaver, walk into the South Tower when the tower started to fall. Jason, one of the agents, grabbed my shoulder and just said, run. And I remember looking up. And if you ever see how the tower fell, initially it looked like it was lean. It was going to. It looked like it was toppling like a domino towards the East River. But what happened was the top canted and then it collapsed downward. So I ran north. And then what happened was I got hit between the shoulder blades with some piece of debris that probably bounced off the ground. And I wound up – see, there were some police cars around and it was a fire truck. And I, I could fit my fat ass under that fire truck. I'm not going to fit – so I jumped under this fire truck and hid there for a little bit. Um, then the dust cloud hit me in the face, um, which was – you couldn't see because it was very gritty. So if you blinked your eyes, it felt like you were sand paper in your eyeballs. So I came out from under the truck because I said, hey, stupid, you're going to die under this truck. You're going to suffocate. And I ran um, north until I was able to get into a building to get some cover and to wash my eyes out. But it was like, I mean, you know, those guys, I, I literally watched them walk into the plaza as, as the building collapsed on them. And I knew all three of them. John Coglin was one of the first sergeants I ever worked for. Vinny Dans um, was in my academy class. And Walter Weaver was a young cop when I was a detective in the 47th precinct and literally watched them walk in there before the building came down on them. So it was a shitty, shitty place to be and certainly, you know, didn't, um, you know, did, I'm glad I was there because I felt like at least I was able to, to help in some way. I think I probably would have felt worse if I wasn't there. But um, yeah, I, I still have memories from that day that just, they don't, they don't leave, you know, and I talk about that. I, I, I speak sometimes at the 9-11 Memorial Museum a few times a year, uh, which I'm honored to do. And I actually speak with a lot of um, veterans groups about coping with PTSD, you know, because I mean, you know, I have bad memories of that day and you know for years bottled them up and then you realize hey man when it's when you actually ask you know talk to people about things and you get some help it's um it's medicinal you know yeah so if i remember right right 343 firefighters 34 uh nypd and port authority officers um it was 23 new york city cops 37 port authority officers and 343 firemen but the uh, the death toll is much higher now because of 9-11 related cancers you know it's well, i was going to ask you about that because i mean you were down there breathing that shit i now did you work on recovery operations or what did you do i mean th let's finish out the day first i mean what did the rest of the day go like because i mean where do you go with something like that shit's just happening and it's just you know it's not a disaster anymore it's a catastrophe yeah, I was there all day. I mean, you know, once I washed out my eyes, I came out, tried to help some people. Um, we couldn't find – look, you, you, we were trying to find people to, to help them, and either people got out or they died. You know, it was like there weren't many people. In fact, there was one point where we – there was a female agent who was trapped in her car. 
my boss called me and said, hey, can you go find Kara? So we went and found her, me and Bill Sheldon. Bill later died of 9-11 related cancer. I got my right lung carved out because of 9-11 related cancer. But um, we found her and it wasn't like she was pinned in a car like what you would see at like a traffic accident. She was just, she was pregnant and she was stuck in her car mostly out of like fear. She just couldn't get herself out of the car. So we carried her to Be- Beekman Downtown Hospital. And when we walked towards it, you could see like under there's, there's an overpass for the Brooklyn Bridge and you can see all these gurneys as we're approaching um, out front, doctors in scrubs, nurses, you know, uh, people in lab coats. There were no patients on the gurneys. So we, we dropped her off, which was good because she got instant attention. But uh, at the same time, like some of the medical professionals were like, they, they seemed like they were pissed off because they were, hey, man, where is everybody? Like, like as if it was our fault that they didn't have more patients to deal with. But it was like they weren't getting brought patients because people either got out or, or – they died or they just were able to you know walk out of there and seek treatment somewhere else maybe but it was it was really surreal so i i stayed on site really for three days uh, well i left on the morning of the third day really um and we just tried to help you know fill holes and just you know be be as useful as you could be for what was needed at that moment you know so but yeah I, and you know i, I spent Many days after that, down there, you know, on the bucket brigade, just doing what folks did. But the FBI folks down there, uh, DEA. I mean, it was just all hands on deck, just people trying to do the right thing in, in such a catastrophe, you know. What was the uh, diagnosis on your lung that you lost your right lung? Well, it happened in 2018. I was mentoring a class of ASACs at the Army War College in Carlisle. It's a funny story, actually, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And I was drinking with an old timer. Only a cop can say, ah, I lost part of my lung. Yeah, but hey, it's a funny story. Let me tell you a funny story. You know? <laughs> no, it is. I, I was, I was, there was an old timer that worked for ATF. He was a former uh, DC Metro hostage negotiator, dude named Pete Mangan. Just a great guy. And um, I used to like going to the Army War College program and i was tasked with uh, being a mentor this this particular class um and we would always meet at this place called the gingerbread man which is a real cheap bar with ice cold beer in carlisle pennsylvania and uh i coughed i had i felt like i had bronchitis my wife gave me bronchitis so i just felt like i had some remnants of it and i coughed up some blood in the sink and i'm like oh shit that's not good but i may, so maybe i tore something so then the following morning i coughed up some more blood and I was like, "This isn't good." I saw Breaking Bad. I saw what happened to Heisenberg. So I, let me let me go to uh, to the urgent care. So I, I went to an urgent care in Mechanicsville, Pennsylvania, and I get an X ray. And I, when I walk in, there's like two little kids waiting to see a doctor with their mothers, and there's me. So the doctor takes an X ray, and it's this is a cheap little shitty little urgent care. I mean, they're probably wonderful people, but I'm saying the facility itself was kind of dingy. And I could hear the doctor on the other side of the door. After they see my x-ray, he's like, oh, Jesus. Oh, fuck. I can't tell this guy this. This guy's going to freak out. He's talking to the nurses. And I'm like, I'm sitting there like, I can fucking hear you, man. So, But anyway, uh, he comes in and he tells me, he's like, hey, uh, you know, we found a little something. It could be anything. It could be artifact, which I was like, okay, I don't know what that means. Um, he goes, but you know, we're going to have a radiologist look at it. and We'll, we'll call you later. So, um, so he gives me a prescription for um, uh, albuterol pump. And for a, an oral um, steroid, you know, corticosteroid. So a couple hours later, I get a phone call from a radiologist from the urgent care. He's like, hey, Mr. Faselli, oh, we have a, a relationship with a nearby hospital. It's only about a half an hour from here. And uh, we would really like for you to come back here. and we'll, we'll get you a CAT scan. I'm like, nah. I was like, at that point, I just realized I'm getting on a plane. I'm going back to Miami because I was a special agent in charge of the, the Miami field division at the time. Lo and behold, they, they did the, the CAT scan and turned out to be cancer. I, but I was blessed because they took out the lung. They took out 17 lymph nodes and um, there was no, it didn't spread. So I didn't need chemo. I didn't need radiation. If my wife didn't give me bronchitis, I'd probably be dead. And so that was in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were you able to trace it back to uh, ground zero? The doctors did. Yeah. So luckily, um, you know, my my aftercare, like after the surgery, everything was covered by the World Trade Center Health Program, which uh, is a really good thing that that's in place. How did they trace it back to that? They just know for certain types of cancers, like um, you know, based on I guess their research. But they, they they you have to send you have to submit it to the World Trade Center Health Program, and then they they certify it. And I guess it's it, the, the cancer that I have is called a atypical carcinoid neuroendocrine tumor. Which when I saw the things, oh, I, you know, 
I got the, the biopsy report before the doctor spoke to me. So when I saw neuroendocrine, my first thought is, holy shit, I have a brain tumor that's metastasized to my lung. But it was it's actually just kind of a rare cancer that I was, uh, was fortunate enough to catch early. Did you ever know uh, an FBI agent named Dave Lavalley? Ended up no. being the FBI sack in Atlanta. He was in New York during that time, and he died uh, as the sack of uh, FBI sack in Atlanta. He died from uh, illnesses sustained during 9-11 from being out there on the bucket brigade. They say Horrible. more people have died of 9-11 related illness than, than 9-11. Yeah, which is uh, tragic. How many of your friends total have you lost from that? I lost six good friends on 9-11, three that I saw walk into the building, three others I had worked with, um, and a fireman. And uh, But yeah, I, I know 18 people who have died since then. Um, pe- young lady I feel trained, Jennifer Meehan, recently died of brain cancer. Um, Charlie Clark, I mean, I go on and on. So, I, But I've lost three times as many friends from 9-11 related illness than I lost on 9-11. Wow, that's horrific. Yeah. yeah, and it's I I get the well one thing I, I do a couple things one is I donate every month I have a recurring donation set up to Tunnels to Towers because I think what he's doing and helping the Gold Star families and the law enforcement officers and stuff you know build homes and get mortgage free homes th- that's something to do but the other thing too is I monitor I, I mean I, I get all the email updates from the Officer Down Memorial page you know odmp dot org uh, and every now and then you see one come across and you look at cause of death and it's nine 11, you know, it's the, we are still 20 years later, 22 years later, losing people from nine 11. Yeah. Yeah. I I did the tunnel to towers run this year. You're right. It's an an amazing organization. Uh, I didn't run it. I'm not going to lie and say I ran the whole five K. I probably ran about half of it. Yeah. Uh, But you only have half a lung. I mean, you only have half your lung capacity, right? Yeah. Yeah. But both my kids and, uh, the gentleman I believe is going to be my future son-in-law ran it with me. So it's, it, we've turned it into a family thing to, nice. to pay tribute to the folks that fell on that day. You know? Very nice. Yeah. Hey players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out as always on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two.